point because I was up in the barn he had left me a very precarious position but he thought he was gambling at that point so I didn't want to cover I doubled him and somehow gambling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was it a race or what what was it and you Hi there. Good morning. How are you? Hi. How are you today? Good. Good morning. Let me see. Um, ABCD. EFG. <laughs> okay. Phil? You get the numbers. Oh, for your <laughs> Hey, uh, oh, here it is. Email? They did ship your box. Oh, no, I didn't get it. He sent me an email saying, oh. should you show the date? He said somebody actually got it. So there's somebody at your place that's holding that uh, bathroom box. So I don't know. We'll see. You'll see the email from Nick. Okay. okay. Thanks. So I just click on this when you go like that, right? Right. I'll look at you and tell you. I got to face you. So, fake plate. I don't think All right, we're getting started over here. Are we ready? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get started. Okay. Get the muscle going there. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I want you to know that we are streaming and recording this. It's going to go up on YouTube. I've got a YouTube channel uh, by by the unusual name of Phil Simborg, uh, and the, I've got quite a few subscribers. But I get a lot of hits off of random people from the internet because I tag it as backgammon lessons, backgammon information backgammon, symbord, so on, things that are very interesting to people. So I hope, I'm hoping a lot of people will see this, uh, not just in the live stream that we're doing now, but eventually uh, we'll see this uh, and maybe get interested and get involved in the game more and see that it's not just a game that you have to learn tremendous amounts of numbers. That's my, the thrust of my lecture today is that there are different approaches to learning backgammon, and we're going to go through them pretty quickly, and then I'll give you a demonstration of how you can get pretty good at this game without having to crunch a whole bunch of numbers. I got really turned off. I played this game for, oh, by the way, I'm Phil Simborg from the Backgammon Learning Center. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me online, Backgammon Learning Center, www.thebackgammonlearningcenter.com. We have 15 teachers teaching on the Internet in eight languages all over the world. Uh, we've had over four or five hundred students. I think it's about 460 students now. Uh, many of them have won major tournaments all over the world. This is the best and quickest path to become a great player. Uh, so uh, consider taking lessons and, and, and raising your game. I see several of my students and ex-students in the crowd right here today, and uh, happy to have you here. Uh, I'm also doing boot camps with Mochi uh, and Perry Gartner. Mochi and I are, are running a boot camp coming up in New York City. Uh, before the tournament starts, we did one in Cyprus and Vegas. They were very uh, interesting and successful. And uh, uh, Blake, uh, you're here. You went to the one in Cyprus and sent us a very nice testimonial. And you're going to do another one with us the next time you have a chance. Uh, and uh, they're a lot of fun. There's a lot of ways to, to improve your game. Let's get into the subject of how do you become a better backgammon player. Uh, basically, uh, there's, here's how we learn to play backgammon. Michelle? is helping me with this. You watch others play is pretty much how people start. Uh, you start playing yourself and you learn the game. Uh, you start watching some online videos. By the way, everybody who comes to me who's a beginner and wants to learn the game, I won't teach you. I say, first of all, you're wasting your time and money. Go to YouTube and search backend and lessons and there's a whole bunch of good videos and that's a real fast, easy way to learn the basics of the game. So watch the videos and then go ahead, uh, Michelle, you can read articles, books and articles. Uh, back in the software, uh, that software right now is really evolved. Uh, Extreme Gammon, www.extremegammon.com is what every top player in the world is using. It works beautifully, it's a great teaching aid, and it's a very fast way to learn the game. And it's been proven by some of the greatest players in the world today, they became great players in a very short period of time working with Extreme Gammon, and we learn a lot from that. And of course, teachers and mentors. Uh, one of the main ways that I learned was from mentors. I, put, I had the advantage of uh, playing in Chicago with Howard Ring, Neil Kazaroff, Jake Jacobs. I had some of the best players in the world, and they were really nice guys. David Wells, 
uh, and they worked with us and played with us, and they were very generous in their coaching and teaching. It's a great way to improve, and then I started uh, playing for uh, money at my real estate office, and I started nothing in the world that I wanted more than to beat my older brother, so I secretly went out and I contacted a buddy of mine from Bridge by the name of Kip Wolsey, started taking lessons about 35 years ago, and, uh, and, and I've been corrupted ever since, and now I'm the wasted person that you see today before you, uh, wasting and back in show. So, how do we become experts? How do you get to the higher level of playing backhand? Show. There's only one route to becoming a top, top backhand player. Deliberate practice. And uh, all the books, and I've read every book that I'm becoming an expert. I don't care if it's golf, tennis, uh, ping pong, uh, backhand and chess. Everyone has to use deliberate practice. Uh, and deliberate practice is getting much more deeply into the details. Uh, what is talent? How do you become talented? I read a, a great book recently called The Talent Code that defined it. And basically they said you have to have a mission, you have to have a burning desire to get good. If you want to get good, you have to really care and really want to play. It's a master coaching. That doesn't mean you have to have a teacher or mentor, but again, Extreme Gammon is a master coach in books and so on. Uh, deep practice is the same as deliberate practice. It's not just playing and looking at your mistakes. It's diving into the details of each little area of the game. That's how you become good. And by the way, even there's many people in this room that are not like the, the top giants in the world. They don't want to dedicate their lives to that game. They just want to become pretty good players. You, you want to be able to beat your friends or your father or your brother or whoever. Uh, or come to these tournaments and, and have a reasonable chance to win, you're not going to dedicate your whole life to it, you still need deliberate practice. You still need to look at just bearing off and play with just bearing off and just the opening moves and just a back game. Maybe take a 2-4 back game and see how you play it and watch it for a while and play just one thing at a time. That's deep. That's deliberate practice. Let's try, start to develop the, the, the flow and the idea of how these games play out and some reference positions and some ideas about the numbers, we'll get into that. That's how you get better. There are three things in common that i found. That I've, I've interviewed all of the top players in the world, virtually every one of them. In fact, if you go to my uh, YouTube stream, you'll see that recently I interviewed uh, uh, Jordan Grandstead, who just won Monte Carlo for the third time, the only person in the world to do that. I interviewed Wilcox Snelling, one of the great players from the 80s and 90s. I've interviewed uh, Matt cohn right, this for the second time. These are video uh, podcast interviews, and I have many on backgammon galore. I've got Falafel, I've got Mochi. I've gone through all the really top players because I think it's fun to find out what makes them tick and what they <coughs> think about backgammon and their approach. I also get into their personal lives and stuff. But every single time I do an interview, I learn something about how they approach the game. And I found that every single top player in the world has three things in common. Number one, they're all smart. Uh, they're all smarter than me. I promise you, if you did an IQ test, uh, every one of them. Now, I read a book called Emotional Intelligence by Goldman. It says there's seven kinds of intelligence. I can tell you that there are backgammon giants out there that can't tie their shoes. They're idiots. Uh, they can't drive a car. They, 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 can't, they can't hit the toilet seat. They, I mean, they're not smart in every area. But when it comes to the area that makes you a great, uh, a great thinker for backgammon, they're great, and by the way, they're not just great things for backgammon. I could go on, uh, on and on about how how we have uh, Matt Ballard is one of the greatest go players in the world. I think he's the best Caucasian go player in the world, and the best non non Asian uh, go player in the world, a, a top Scrabble player. The Jake Jacobs, uh, these guys have IQs that are off the wall. I can't tell you how smart Roberti is and, and uh, Sankiewicz, and these guys are all proven great chess players. We have people like Victor Ashkenazi, who right now has the lowest. Uh, PR uh, on the back end of Masters rating. He's a vice president of Goldman Sachs. We have millionaires. We have geniuses uh, playing back end. These guys are provably smart. So you have to be really smart, but you don't have to be brilliant to be really good at back end. I'm pretty good, and I'm not brilliant. But to be a great, great top giant, one of the really top players, they're all very smart people. So it helps to have the right parents and get the right genes. Next, they all got there with deliberate practice, every single one. And I bet you 10,000 hours is, is short for most of them. Falafel got out of college, went to New York, and started sleeping under benches at night in, in the park and, and eating and breathing back in and chess every day and learning it for hours and hours and hours. There's been a couple of exceptions, two uh, that are most notable in the last, few, in last in recent history. Uh, Matt Cohn, Geyer, and Stick came out of nowhere, at no time at all became great. 
mostly using Snowy and then Extreme Gam and GNU, but the computers and reading the books, they did it very quickly, but I'll still bet you they got in more than 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, even even though they just, they just uh, uh, Emoji dropped out of one of, the, one of the best universities in Japan. And Kiko is number three player in the world, has a degree in law, and all she does is play backhand. They've dedicated their lives, even though they have these other interests, to backhand, and that's how they got to be so good. And But the number one thing they have in common, if you take every great player in the world, there's only one thing that I have found that they all have in common, every single one of them, and that is they make the same decisions. They play pretty much like the computer plays. Not all the time, not every time. You can take 10 giants and show them a tough position and you might get three different answers. In fact, it just happened at the Twins in Cyprus, that Mochi game, they had a panel of giants and, and there were several that they all disagreed on. But overall, by the end of the match, almost all of their decisions were the same decision, even though they might get there a different path and a different way and a different way of thinking. There's different styles. Uh, Falafel and, and, and Victor and David Wells, who is one of my heroes, one of the great visual players of the game, they look at the position, they have a feel for how it works, and they just sort of know what's right, what the right play is. And, and of course, they just sort of know because they put in a lot of their practice and study, but they have a feel for the game. Guys like John O'Hagan, who just posted some of the lowest PRs ever, and uh, one of my teaching partners and a great, great teacher, he approaches almost everything with math. He, calculates how many gammons there are, how many back gammons there are, what are the odds of winning, what's the gammon to just the take point, and does it all mathematically. Uh, Kit and Neil do a lot of that too. Uh, and Mochi uh, will do it. And Mochi and Michi, the number one and two players in the world, you should see the reference positions that they have. They have a group that they study, and they approach it by reference position. But they all end up making the same right decision. Now, most of us, and almost everybody in this room, is going to have a hell of a time if you're going to try and learn the game the way I've been learning and a lot of the way I've been teaching in the last uh, 20 years is by, a lot of this is by numbers. It takes too much time and work to know and calculate and remember these numbers and do them over the board. There is an easier approach to becoming a very good player and maybe even a top player if you put in enough deliberate practice. And that approach, well, let's go through the how they make the decision. There's three approaches. One is... Uh, a library of reference positions. Uh, and I don't just mean a library. Like, I, I, mean, I just don't mean, I think, I think Michi has 7,000 reference positions on his computer. I think you have to attack reference position, what we call bunching. I read a, a great book on how bunching works. If you want to remember, for example, uh, the right way to <coughs> play double two on the second roll, you should study every first roll and then double two. You bunch them, you put them together, and by the end of half an hour, you'll know exactly how to play double two on the second roll because you put it together, and when you're playing over the board, you'll remember, oh, you played a six three, I know what to do with my double two. You'll know exactly what to do because it's bunched. There's a, there's a scientific background to this. Uh, John O'Higgins and I wrote an article on it after researching it carefully. The scientific <laughs> answer is when you put a bunch of similar things together in your brain, the, there's little neurons and little nerves that move through your brain that, that light up when you're trying to access your memory. And the more you bunch things together, the thicker the myelin sheath is around those neurons. And the thicker it is, the heavier it is, the quicker and easier it is to go to that spot in your brain and remember this. You remember, you can't remember where you put your keys. I could ask, uh, I could ask uh, John O'Hagan or Stick or, or, or Matt where he put his keys, and they, they, they go nuts. Or in fact, sometimes they don't even remember where they live or where they're staying. But you ask them, uh, you ask them about a position, and they'll tell you. Uh, uh, Jake Jacobs can tell you in 1983 what the waitress is wearing when he gammoned the guy. I mean, <laughs> so when it comes to bunching, the way your memory works. That's the way you study reference positions. And everybody needs reference positions. Everybody in this room has a great reference position. How do you play an opening 3-1? How long would it take you to play an opening 3-1? That's a reference position. You know that opening position well. You know what to do with the 3-1. Well, the, the more of those kinds of positions you have, the more positions that you look at and you instantly know what's right, the better you're going to be. You could take Albert Einstein, put him in front of a board, show him a blitzing position, and ask him what the gammons are going to be, and whether it's a double and a take, and he would have no idea, because he has no reference. He has no idea. Any, anybody in this room, most of the people in this room wouldn't have an idea from a normal blitzing position, whether it's a double, whether it's a take, and, and whether you should hit or not, most of the time, because you've bunched it, because it's a reference position. Second, calculating numbers over the board. Again, John O'Hagan is my mentor in this area. 
John will look at a position. I'll show you an example. And he'll calculate the number of gammas. If you win and lose, he'll come up with a gamma adjusted take point. He'll you put in the cube bid. he will come up with a number that says that I have to win the game 32% of the time to take, and he'll estimate the game wins 34%. So it's a it's a take. That's one approach to the game. That's an approach that if you're John O'Hagan and you're a genius with numbers and you have a great memory and you have nothing else to do but study backgammon, that you can become a great player. Most of us don't have the time or the skills to do that, although some of that in some areas are going to be necessary, but it's not the only approach. That's what I'm going to get into today. And the third area is have a great visual sense for the game. The first real good example I had of this was, was David Wells. Now, he's an Australian uh, who from Boston, moved to Chicago. He's probably one of the best money players in the world. He's a great poker player, too. But David would look at a position, and I'd say, David, why, why is this a double? He says, it's so pretty. Look at, look at the setup. It just looks so smooth. It looks like I can really take this forward in a nice way. I said, well, why would you take this to? He says, well, I see some I see some joy here. I've got some pleasure here. I think I got a shot. I think I got a shot at anchoring and hitting him. It's all by visual. He isn't going to tell you that it's 16% gammas and 32% wins. And he's not going to come up with those numbers, but he's going to come up with the right answer all visually. And I couldn't believe that he could do that. Victor Ashkenazi <coughs> plays pretty much the same way. Falafel is largely this way. Falafel, I know the numbers better than Falafel. He's 10 times the player that I am, but if we sat down in front of, a, in front of many of these positions because I've studied the numbers, I can come up with a percentage of gamuts and I can come up with a percentage of wins in many positions, probably much better than Falafel because I've studied them and I've learned to do it this way, but Falafel's going to make the right decision much more often than I am because he's got that visual sense of the game. Vicker, who came from chess, did the approach back in the same way, and now he may be the best player in the world. He's certainly up there, uh, one of the top two or three. So I'm going to center, I'm going to show you the differences, and then we're going to focus on the visual part. I'm going to tell you that my whole, the whole reason I hope some of you are here is to learn another approach so that maybe you can become better without having to crunch all those numbers. Because the numbers are hard. They're intimidating. They're hard to remember. And it's a lot of damn work over the board. Let's, we're here to have fun. Let's not forget that I don't think there's too many of us in this room that, that, want, to, that want to strive to be the number one back end of the player in the world. I don't want to. I think uh, I, I, maybe I would have a shot at it if I gave up my teaching and I gave up my, my third wife and, uh, <laughs> and the rest. You know, I've never let my wives get in, in the way of my back end until this time. So this is why I've been able to keep this one. So <laughs> I'm not going to give that up to try and become number one. And I don't think I could become number one, but I could probably become a lot better. But it's not worth the effort. I'd rather be. I like to go to movies. I like to give lessons. I like to be with, go out to dinner and have fun. I have another life. So all of you do too. There's a better and faster and easier way where you can become damn good, and I'm going to show you that today. So there are three approaches. They overlap. Here's a good reference position that most good players know. I'm going to put Ed Rosenblum on the spot because Ed wrote a great book called Conquering Backhand, and I'm just going to put you on the spot. What? Do you recognize this position? I do. This is called a four-roll, four-roll position. Red is on roll. Can you tell me what the cube action is here for money? Double take. Double take. It took two seconds. He knows this position. Uh, Ken Bame, you're a great player. Do you know what percentage of the time Blue wins this game? Somewhere around 22, 23. Somewhere around 22, 23. Uh, very good guess. Uh, but see, again, it's a reference position. You don't have to crunch the numbers. You don't even have to know it's 22, 23%. If you're playing in a money game, you know you should double and you know you should take. That's all you need to know if you play for money. But when you start again in the match play, then you really do need to know the percentages because whether you can win 22% or 26% is going to be a take or a pass, depending on the score. So that's why match play is so much more interesting, so much more demanding, and so much more complicated. And that's where you do have to get into the numbers. But let me show you what Extreme Gammon says. Extreme Gammon says, and I don't know if you can read this, Extreme Gammon says you win 24.7% of the time in this position. So it is, and it does say it's a double and a take. It would be about a 5% error to pass this cube. So the, what this, first of all, uh, Ken was not, not off by much, only about 2%, and he's going to be right in most situations and most scores. But if the score was 3 away, 3 away, or if it was a recube at 5 away, 5 away, this is a pass. It's not a take. It's a take for money, but it's not a take in different match scores. That's why you have to know the numbers as well when you get into match play. I have a question. Does it have to be 25? Pardon me? Doesn't you have to be 25%? Ah, great, great, great question. How can a money game, how can you take for less than 25%? He's, you're absolutely right. You're not going to break even unless you can win at least 25% of the time. Well, this 24.7 is 
again, this is a little blurry, it, that's the cubeless equity. That means if nobody ever doubled and played this game out to the end, Blue would only win this game a little less than 25% of the time. But because he's holding the cube, he's going to win more. He does win more than 25% because the cube adds value. It gives him cube big. So because he's holding the cube, it's quite possible he'll get in a recube. What if red rolls takes off two checkers, and blue rolls doubles and takes off four checkers. Now red takes off two checkers, and it's blue's roll. If blue's roll there, <coughs> when you're down to where blue has two, a two-roll position, and red has a two-roll position, and blue's on roll, blue wins this game 86% uh, of the time, and red only wins 14%. So blue will redouble, red has to drop, and now blue has won a game that he would have lost 14% if he wasn't holding the cube. So by gaining that 14% advantage by using the cube, that takes this 24% to something over 25. John O'Hagan will tell you exactly how much. My guess is it puts it at about 26, 27%. Maybe. But certainly it's over 25%. Great question, though. In a money game, you need 25%. Yes? There's another element that I rarely hear mentioned, and I would like to ask you about in a position exactly like this. Suppose I'm red, but Falafel's blue. Would you advise him to take my cube? Ah, that's a good question. Should, a, should Falafel take your cube? I don't think Falafel should take any cube from you. No, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, I was playing Falafel in the semifinals of a tournament. I think it was in San Antonio. And I doubled him at a, a, at a four cube where he had a take by about 2% to take. And he took. And he won. And everybody criticized Falafel. Said, look, you're playing Phil Simbor. You're, and he's a good 3 PR better than me. Falafel will probably play a little about 2.5, and, and I'm going to play at 4.5, 5.5, something in that range when I'm playing well. And I was playing well. I was winning tournaments. I was ranked high. And I'm, I was a decent player. Falafel argued then that that whole theory is below him. He doesn't worry about that, except in extreme situations, he's going to play to play as good as he can and not focus on his opponent. Now, Mochi doesn't totally agree with that. I've seen Mochi will, when Mochi rolls an opening 4-1, he slots against me. Everybody knows it's a 1.5% error to slot instead of split with an opening 4-1. But he feels he's got that much of an advantage over me. I taught him a lesson in Las Vegas two weeks ago when I beat him in the, in the, uh, in the second round of the tournament. Uh, but I got lucky. He outplayed me. But again, the better players do have, in some kinds of positions, they might be better off not taking chances. Blake? Yeah, Sankiewicz told me that uh, basically when he's playing a weaker player, he gets into complicated situations uh, that a weaker player might not have the experience to deal with. Very good. And that, that brings up your point very, very much. This is not a complicated situation. And maybe, maybe Mochi should and there's drop no this There's no skill game. in this position, yeah, other than the cube. There's there, no skill at all. There's very, there's no skill, and it is close. Uh, but he would be making a five percent error to take. Should he make a five percent error, he should certainly maybe drop it. If it was a two percent error, if it was a ten percent error, he absolutely should. So there's a range in there. It, it, it's yeah, debatable. Yes. Where start doing that, it's that you. It's complicated play for inferior play or when you start doing that, they're giving away the reason that they're better. You know? Yeah. Like, it's really a very good <laughs> point. He's dropping it because he feels his opponent is weaker. He's giving away some of the things that Yeah, if you couldn't hear that, his point, your point, what's your name, sir? Richard. Richard. Richard's point was that if he starts making intentional mistakes, he's no longer better than you are. But again, in certain types of situations like this, I think it's a good point. I'm not sure, I'm not sure Falafel should take this against you or me. He is that much better. It, it gets close. We're getting a little off the subject, though. I want to get. I want to keep going with the, with the lecture, the point of the lecture. So, we, because we saw that last position, that's a reference position. Everybody in the room knows that last position. This position, all I did was take the two checkers off the one and the two and put them on the six and the four point. This is close. Uh, let me put somebody on the spot. John Viator, do you think this is a better position for blue or worse than the last position? Worse. Worse. Do you think blue's in worse shape now? Yeah. Okay, does, uh, Ted Chi, you're shaking your head. No, no, no. You think Blue's in better shape? Yeah, no. Blue's in much better shape. Mm -hmm. Blue has got a better situation here than last time. Why does he have a better situation? Who can answer that for me? Brandon, you're shaking your head. Uh, more bad red numbers. Can miss. Red, red can uh, miss. There's more bad numbers for him. At this point in the game, there are three things that can happen after, after the cube is turned or not turned. Three things that can happen. Oh, go back. Oh. The previous... Right-click and previous. You need your glasses, huh, Chef? I'm old. 
Do I make you click too much? Is there, do I no, no, I just wanted to see? move along. I know I have that effect on women. Right click yeah. and hit previous. Got it. Whoops, no. Okay. Go back. Go, go. Whoops, That's good enough. So. That's the next one. But <laughs> you can see that this is now Oops. this is now much better for Blue. Blue was going to win 24% before, 24.7. Now he's winning 29. And as Brandon said, rent to miss. But there are three things that can happen. If they roll, they can roll about the same, which is usually what happens. About most of the time, they roll about the same. If they roll about the same, because red's on roll, red's going to win. Red could roll better, and red will win. Or blue could roll better, and that's the only way that blue can win. So the more ways that blue has to roll better, the more likely he is to win. And the longer the race is, if it's a racing situation like this with no contact, the longer it is, the more chances there are for blue to roll better. Blue could roll better doubles than red. In the other position, the doubles were pretty much the same. And whether you rolled any double, double twos was better than double ones, but that's about it. In the other position, blue had to roll doubles to win. In this position, blue doesn't have to roll doubles to win. All blue has to do is not miss when red misses. If blue rolls high numbers and red rolls low numbers, if, if red rolls a three or a five in the first roll, or particularly a three, and blue doesn't, he's got a big advantage. So we know from our references uh, without ever, this is not a reference position for me. I didn't have this one memorized, but you can tell from the previous one that this got better. This is bunching. From now on, you'll know, and this is how I teach end game cubes. I start with the four roll, four roll, and I start moving it around, and I keep saying, is this better or worse? And not only that, I start keep guessing at this number. I could have guessed this number within a half a percent before I saw it usually within 1%, but this is so easy for me because I've done it enough times after teaching for 20 years for four hours a day, six days a week, I think I can finally remember a few of these positions and get these right. So right now, Oops. most of you in this room are as good as Falafel or Mochi or anybody on these kinds of positions. And these positions come up often. And by the way, in Mochi's lecture uh, on reference positions, one of the key things that he says is a good reference position is one that comes up often. That's the good thing. The second good thing about the reference position is if it's borderline, if it's barely a take or barely a double. That way you know when you shift one checker this way, it's not a double. If you shift one checker this way, it's not a take. You can, you can figure these things out with references. So reference positions are key. But again, here's what I'm showing you. There's a visual thing here. David Wells probably doesn't know all these numbers, but he knows that for money it's a bear, it's a small take. So in a match he knows that if this score it would be a big drop and if this score it wouldn't even be a double. So just he can have a feel for it. Same thing with Victor and 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 and, uh, and and Falafel and other top players. They can do it visually. John O'Hagan knows these numbers by heart. He can crunch the numbers, and we figure out he could actually count the rolls. Even if he never saw the previous reference position, he could figure out how many times you roll a three and miss, and how many times the other guy in response rolls a three or five and misses. And does he get into redouble? And what are the odds? And you know, that's another approach to the game that I don't want you guys to start taking because it's going to drive you nuts. That comes later. Okay, let's go on. One more example. This is a very, very good reference position. It's the common blitz position. Blue started with a 5-2. He split and brought one down, which is the right play. Red rolled double five, and blue came in with one checker. Uh, who could I put on the spot here? Michelle? I cube. You cube. Do you take? No. Okay. Anybody have another opinion? <laughs> Michelle doubles and, and, drop, and there's a pen. John? I've always believed that if you have another block inside the board, it's a take. If it's outside, then it's a pass. Okay, so you believe this is a take. Is yeah. it a double? Yeah. Okay. So this is a very well-known position that... I, all of my students I have memorized because it's such a common position and it's so important to know this position. This position, uh, I'll show the answer, Michelle, is barely zero, 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 whether or not you double or not. It's a monster wow. take. It's right on the edge of whether you double or not for money. Talking about for a money game. So it's right on the edge of a double. Zero, 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 that's rolled out. Uh, on, this is a beta program that I'm testing for Xavier. There's, uh, Myself and Mochi and Neil Kazaros for the very start of beta tested all of the Extreme Gammons and helped them develop uh, the program. And by the way, when you buy Extreme Gammon, go to Extreme Gammon, buy it, 60 bucks, join the U.S. Backgammon Federation, which I strongly recommend, and you'll get a 20% discount. Uh, when you get uh, when you buy Extreme Gammon, you absolutely must have it. Uh, for those of you watching online, if you're, even if you're a beginner, this is the best way to learn and improve your game. You can play against it. 
uh, if the drop down screen asks you where you heard about it from the internet, from a friend, or from Phil Simberg, please check me. I make five bucks. I get very wealthy from it. <laughs> but also, I want to tell you, when you get Extreme Gammon, in a couple of years you'll understand it and know how to use it completely. So take those two years and work on it, or spend 25 bucks and buy a one hour video from me, and in one hour you'll know everything about how to set it up and how to use it. And that 25 bucks I donate to the United to the uh, International Collegiate Scholarship Fund. Every penny that goes to pay for kids. Uh, uh, scholarships who play backgammon around the world. It's a program that Mochi and I have just started. We've raised $10,000 that we're going to give away to kids all over the world. In addition to that, we've got generous donations of all kinds of gifts. We've got 50 watches for the Alan Grunwald that are fantastic, gorgeous watches that the kids are going to get, books and so on. So buy the video as well. I've been authorized by Xavier, the owner of Extreme Gammon, to sell this video on behalf of the organization. Let's get back to this position. No, go back. Oh. Go back. <laughs> now, now, the no double and the double is exactly the same? Is, it's exactly the same, whether you double or not. So, so why, is double the best choice, why is the best choice no double? Well, because it had to say something. <laughs> it could have said double, it could have said no double, because it's on the fence. It doesn't know how to say, it, it's it's it didn't set it up to say double or no double. So it, it, it just picked one. Uh, but this position, by the way, uh, if you move Blue's checker that's on the four point, let's say he didn't come in on the four, and he came in on the two, who thinks that that's better for blue to come in on the two than the four? You do? Who thinks it's worse? Okay. It's better for blue to come in on the four, on the two rather. Right. And so if you come in on shot. the two, it's even a bigger take and it's for sure no double. Then it would be a mistake to double. I think it's about a 4% error to double. Why is it better to come in on the two? Because he's less likely to get hit and blitz. He can't get blitz. He's more likely to get an acre. Conversely, if he had come in on the five, almost all of us, and I thought so too, first time I saw it, that he was in on the five point, we all think that's a better position for blue. It's much worse for blue, because that's where red really wants to hit him. And he hits him with ones and threes. He, he points on him with double one, double four, and three one. He hits him loose with a one, three, or an eight. And if he doesn't hit back, it's toast. So coming in on the five point is a small double, only a .024 double. I mean, I know these numbers, but there's something else about this position that's very interesting. This is where you can combine the positional with the numbers. It's very interesting here, and I'm not looking, but I'm telling you that blue wins this game about 40% of the time. I think it's actually 39%, and he gets gammoned about 30% of the time. Now, John O'Higgins we crunch the numbers. By the way, if he turns the game around, blue will gammon red about 9% of the time. Will he get it right? 9% is right, 29%, 39%, I was right there. Am I a genius? No, it's bunched. It's part of the bunching that I've done by looking at this position in similar positions. Knowing those numbers, why does that matter? If you only play for money, you don't need to know those numbers. All you need to know is this is borderline double. And by the way, you should double anybody you think might drop this key. Some people might drop this key. We heard somebody who would drop it later. You should double, uh, you should probably double a giant. You should double a full of emoji if you're playing them for money because if you get lucky and hit here, you can win a gamma. So maybe you should gamble against them. If your name is Mochi and you're doubling and you're playing Phil Sibor, you certainly shouldn't double because you know he knows that I'm going to take this cube and I could get lucky and anger and he could lose it. So your point earlier was, was very, very right about playing the opponent. But when you're playing an equal player, that's what Extreme Gammon assumes, this is, this is right on the border and you can use the numbers to help you. But again, visually, David Wells would look at this position and he just knows this is a pretty position for, for red, but not quite pretty enough to double. You take another checker from here, and you put it down here, and you know he's doubled. You take red, blue's other checker, put it on the bar where he danced, which happens 25% of the time, big drop. We all know that's a big drop, because now the gammons went from 30% to 40%. The wins went from 40% to 30%. Very simple thing to remember, that they just flip-flop the wins and gammons when you have two checkers on the bar. So there's a visual approach, there's a mathematical approach, and there's a reference position approach and all three combined. The top players use all three all the time. That's why they can play speed gammon so well. I've watched really, really top. By the way, I play speed gammon better than I play slow. The longer I think, the more wrong I'm likely to be. So speed gammon works great for me because I've had enough reference positions to where my gut feeling is usually better than if I try and work out the numbers. That's why I'm giving this lecture today about playing from the position and not just from the numbers because for some people it works better. It works better for me. If I play, uh, I, I guarantee you I have a better chance of beating Mochi playing speed gammon than I do playing slower gammon. Because the longer we think, the more likely I am to be wrong, and the longer we think, the more likely he is to be right. Because he's smarter than me. Okay, 
So what? Uh, all right, that's okay. Show that picture. So what happened uh, is that in the last few years, we got it. We had uh, the back end of the learning center has been tremendously successful. We've had an influx of students that, that I couldn't handle. Uh, I was I, I, Terry Gardner and I started the organization. We immediately brought on uh, Stick and John O'Hagan, two of the best players in the world, and we got full. We could handle all the students we could handle. Plus, we had people who wanted to teach in other languages. So I started bringing on teachers, and we now have eight languages. Uh, unfortunately, speak, Stick is fluent in French, but uh, David Presser uh, really impressed me. I'm going to talk, talk about David in just a second, a little bit right now. David uh, was getting his master's degree. He's from Israel. He lives in Tel Aviv. He speaks English very very well. He's getting his master's degree at Northwestern in finance. And while he's studying to get his master's degree, he's playing at our club in Chicago. And in a very short period of time, he became the number one player at our club. And when he first started playing at the club, he wasn't that good. And he really got that much better that fast. In maybe a year, a year and a half, he became the number one player at the Chicago Bar Bar Club, one of the top, top clubs in the world. We've got a lot of great players there. We've got a lot of people who won major tournaments, the Taki and Bill Davis and David Rockwell, Rory, myself, uh, uh, Herb Roman. Oops, I'm sorry. Herb Roman's never won a tournament. <laughs> uh, Herb Roman's the best player in the world, in my opinion, that's never won a tournament. But we have a lot of great players. And all of a sudden, David's number one. I, I, and I start talking to him about positions, and all of a sudden, he's teaching me stuff that I didn't know. And I, he, he decides he went to you. Uh, he's very, very eloquent, very good at teaching. So we made him one of our teachers, and he's teaching in Hebrew and English. And he has several students. He's now in Israel, and there's a lot of back end going on in Israel. A lot of good players, and David's probably the best player in Israel, except for Waffle, of course, when he's there. So, uh, as, as what I do with our new teachers is, I also monitor them. Uh, I listen to their everything. All of our lessons are recorded. I listen so that I can make recommendations about maybe you should go a little slower here. Maybe you should show a couple more positions. I give them recommendations. At the same time, I'm learning from them. I, a tremendous amount of what I teach, I've learned from my teachers. I've learned from John O'Hagan and Stick and Perry. And David shocked me. He got involved with the Beck and Masters Group, that B M A B, and he, he posted under a 3.5 average, which is unbelievable PR one of the best of the world, but also he is the number two at the cube in the world after Petco. There's only one player in the world that does the, that has shown technically, statistically, that he plays the cube better than David Presser, and that's Petco, who we all know is an amazing player. And I said, David, how did you do this? How did you, in such a short period of time while you're going to college, and you're such a young man, how did you get so good at the cube? He says, well, you know, I, I noted all the things, he explained all the things that, that we teach and all the things that we do, about the, you know, we use Woolsey's law, we use O'Hagan's law, we all the approaches with the numbers and reference positions. But he also said one of the key things he employs is, oh, I'm sorry, that's huh? Joe Sylvester. He employs PRAT, P R A T, it's position, it. race, and threats. Position, race, and threats for lots of positions, and he says, is better than trying to crunch numbers. Now, you can't use position, race, and threats by looking at the, 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 the board and trying to see uh, how am I doing in position, how is my race, and how is my threats. You can't use that in a race. It's all about the race. You can't use that for back games. It's all about timing and the points you make. You can't use it in a priming position. But in general action type games, which are the hardest for me to figure out whether or not it's a cube or not, he says use position, race, and threats. Well, a light bulb went off in my head. Now you can go to the next screen. 25 years ago, a young man moved in with me because he needed a place to live. He was in Chicago, Joe Sylvester, who called a Sly, one of the best players that ever lived. And for several months, he sat there and he taught me back in. And I taught him Jim Rummy and, uh, in return. He is now a great Jim Rummy player. I'm a mediocre back end player. That proves what a great teacher I am, right? <laughs> he's, he's just a great student that I wasn't. So, But one of the things that he was pounding into me was what he called ROT, Race Opportunity Threats, which is pretty much the same as position, race, and threats, same thing. And then light bulb went off that he taught me this 25 years ago, and I stopped using it completely because I started using the methods that I was learning from the books and from John O'Hagan and from my mentors, which is all about the numbers and crunching the numbers and trying to figure out the game and adjust the take point stuff, which is a great approach. And if you can use it, and for certain positions, I'm really good at it, and my students are too. But I forgot completely about looking at the overall position, race, and threats. And that's pretty much, in, in his mind, what Victor Ashkenazi has done. And he's become, again, he's number one in the world at the MAB, and maybe the best player in the world. He may be challenging Mochi. Mochi is real close. Who's better? There isn't enough enough uh, positions and enough 
challenges Nick to say definitively who's better, but he's certainly one of the top two. So what is position race and threats? How does it work? I actually listened to David giving the lesson to some people, and I actually, he actually gave it to me, and I actually took the lesson myself, and now I've started giving the lesson. What you do is if you have a significant advantage in position, race, and threats, in two of the three, you probably have a double. Not always, and of course you could be way up in position and race, and, 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 and so I would still not have a double if the other guy has a real strong race or something like that. But again, if you're winning two of those three, and the way David does it is he gives you, he gives you one point if you have a good lead in, in position, and one point in a good lead in the race, and one point in a good lead in the threats, and if you have a total of two points, and maybe one is 0.7 and another one's 0.5, if the total is two, you've got a double. It's that simple in those kinds of positions. And if you have a reasonable ch chance, if you can make one point, if you have a reasonable chance or a half a point in one of the areas, if you have a decent race, even though your position and threats are bad, you probably have a take. If you can't scrape out one point in combination of these things, then it's probably a pass. And that's how he approaches it, just position, race, threats. What's my position? David, why don't you move in where you can see. Uh, what's my position? Do I have a positional advantage? This is David Wells. How pretty does this look? That's the same thing as when you have a great position. How, how pretty does this look? Uh, John O'Hagan might calculate how many times he's going to escape and how many times he'll make the prime and how many times he'll, he'll be able to hit the point, but that's still the same. It boils down to the same thing. Is it a pretty position? Does it look like you have a positional advantage? So most of the time, you can do this visually. You don't have to crunch a bunch of numbers to see if you have a, a pretty strong positional advantage. Of course, you need to practice it a while to, to see what is how strong is strong. And sometimes you're going to think you have a positional advantage and you forget that the other guy has a good anchor or is likely to anchor. But with, with practice, you can do this pretty well. That David has mastered this, and I'm getting there. I'm working on it a lot. This is the biggest thing that I've been been working on uh, since I since I got this information from David. About, this is about three, four months ago now, and I've been really working on just this area of the game. By the way, every time I do an interview, every time I bring on a new student, I learn at least one thing that takes my game from here to here, just incrementally, and I pass that on to my students. I'll never forget my interview with Matt Gongeyer when he got out of college and he came to Chicago and immediately was one of the best players in the world. And I, in my interview, I said, uh, Matt, I know you have incredible math skills. I know you have incredible memory. He took a nine-point match and put it in by heart into the computer. I know that you're brilliant. You have an incredible brain. Which one of those three things do you think gives you the biggest edge in backhand? He said, none of the above. He said, what gives me the biggest edge, I think, is my ability to hone in on the key issue and ignore the noise. That set off a light bulb. From that moment on, and that's a lot of what this does, that's the key thing that's going on here. Forget about the tip count. The tip count doesn't matter in this position. Forget about the cube. The cube's already been turned. Forget about the scoring. What's happening here? What's the main thing? Focus in on that. That's going to help you with your cube action and your checker play. Well, with David, he hones in on position, race, and threats. Doesn't count, doesn't crunch numbers. Sometimes he'll crunch numbers if it's a, if it's required and if it's a reference position where he needs it. But by using position, race, and threats, and that's what I'm going to really focus on now the visual part of the game, how you can become a really good player. You won't be after this lecture. You will get the basics. You, I'm giving you a tool that you can use. You have to go home and sit down and practice this. You have to practice it over the board. And if you practice it over the board, you have no idea if you're right or wrong unless you take a picture and put it into a string gamut. I mean, because you haven't learned a thing because you think, because it worked. Yeah, oh yeah, I doubled here and I gambled it. That doesn't mean it was right to double. You may have gotten very lucky, like, like I was lucky against Moji a couple weeks ago. If anybody can get lucky. So the only way you're going to learn is with the deliberate practice. You have to take it to the next step. But I'm going to show you how to apply position rates and threats, and I'm going to sit down with some string gamut positions and teach you how David Presser taught me. So let's get into it. Any questions so far? I know I'm doing a lot of talking and going fast. Nobody wants to know anything about my personal life? 